everyone. This is Alex Trumbull. And today, <laughs> today is a good day. Today I have my, me, my great, wonderful, awesome friend, Dr. Diane Hamilton. Dr. Hamilton is an author. Yeah. She's a nationally syndicated radio shows. That's pretty, pretty cool. She is the founder and CEO of her own organization, and she is so much more. <laughs> Thinkers, 50 Radar, considered the Academic Awards, Academy Awards of Leadership, chose her as one of the top minds in management and leadership. She was named Global Leaders Today's list of leaders amongst Elon Musk, you know, uh, Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson, and, and, and Sheryl Sandberg. Uh, she is something. And I have her with us today. And I'm looking forward to talking. How are you doing today, madam? I am doing great. I haven't been called madam in a while. I'm very honored by that. And it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's so nice to be on your show, Alex. I loved having you on mine. We had a ball. You know, that was that was a really, really wonderful time I spent with you. And I love that we talk about curiosity. And that seems to be something that you're you're a bit interested in it, would would you say? A little bit. Little. <laughs> <laughs> it consumes me. It's really been such a fun thing to study. And what's interesting to me is since I've um, created all my research, how much I see other people researching it now. So I'm going to take credit for that, for starting the ball rolling, even though I probably didn't. But uh, it's wonderful to see that curiosity is the hot topic uh, of the moment. And when I had uh, Daniel Goleman on my show, talking about emotional intelligence and other things, of course, for which he's famous, he said, you know, that curiosity is going to be the skill of the future and all these things that how important it's going to be. And that was years ago when I was first doing this research. And uh, since then, everything's just been so much fun to talk about and share all the data and, and everything I've learned. And I love it. Well, I'm sorry for being that guy. I'm, I'm going to be that guy for a second. <laughs> but I'm but I'm curious. I'm curious. That guy. <laughs> like, I'm that guy. I'm curious to what what got you interested in curiosity, and I'm going to prep you. I'm going to find. I'm going to. I'm going to. I'm going to prompt the prime the the tank right. The prime the the pump. Mm -hmm. Why is it so important for leaders today to then understand and and, and dive into curiosity? So let's 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 learn first your origin story. Well, there's a good couple questions there. Remind me the second one and why it's important to leaders. I'm going to start with what got me interested um, because it was really fascinating to me to have people like you and wonderful other people as well on my show. Um, I, I, in addition to my show, I, I'm the former MBA program chair at Forbes School of Business, and I teach at all these different universities, right? And I have all these students that were, some of them be curious and some of them not so curious. And they kind of wanted you to, uh, to give them the fish instead of teach them to fish. And I noticed that when I was interviewing people like you and Steve Forbes and, you know, all these great big names, the billionaires, uh, Keith Brock of DocuSign or whoever was on the show was just so amazing and their, their sense of curiosity. And I started to notice that this was so important to success We've all heard the Warren Buffett and Bill Gates all say that curiosity was the key. And, and it's always been something I found interesting just because I was raised to be uh, someone who I was that why, why, why kid that drove everybody who drove everybody crazy asking all the questions. But we all are when we're young. But I was able to hold on to some of that. And I saw a lot of these people who were really successful, who really held on to it. So it started to make me curious why other people weren't as curious and so I decided to write a book on curiosity just to write about it, but I didn't realize what I was going to end up doing, which was trying to fix this problem um, of why people weren't curious. And because there's a lot of um, research out there about curiosity, why it's important. We know it makes you innovative, engaged and all these things, but nobody was working on how to get it back so much that they had assessments out there that would measure if you had higher or low levels. And which is great uh, to find out where your level is, but it doesn't tell you what's stopping you and how to fix it. So I started to look for the assessment that uh, told me what stops it. And there wasn't anything out there. And so I had to create it. So that was what my research was, the creating the Curiosity Code Index, uh, which, you know, I, I got interested in that because um, 
when I wrote my doctoral dissertation, I, I wrote it on emotional intelligence and its impact on performance. So because of that, I had a lot of experience with personality and different kinds of assessment training. And I decided, you know, this would help me to create this new assessment. And I worked on that for years and it came out when I wrote my book and the, the two together are kind of companions. And so that was what it, the impetus was this sense of, I want to fix this. I'm curious of why people aren't yeah, more yeah, curious yeah. and what stops them. So that was what I found is what keeps people from being curious. Oh, and then your second question, I want to answer of why it's important um, to leadership, right? Was that the second question? That was the second question, but I okay. have another one lined up for you. So we're, we're, whenever you're ready. <laughs> okay, let me answer that one then. Um, on the second one, why it's important. You know, when I'm in front of groups, I, I liken um, curiosity to baking a cake and why it's important. So let's say you're going to bake a cake, Alex, and you've got all your ingredients. You've got your flour and your eggs and whatever you put into your cake, right? And you're mixing your ingredients and you put it in a pan, you put it in the oven. And what happens? Well, you're hoping for cake, mm -hmm. but if you don't turn on the oven, you get goo, right? You don't get your yeah. cake. So let's say in the work setting, if your end cake is not cake, it is productivity money. You, you, that's your cake, your mm -hmm. money. You want to have everybody doing all these productivity things, you know, like you have to be engaged, you have to be innovative. Those are your ingredients. Everybody knows these ingredients are important. We're all mixing mm -hmm. them together. Mm -hmm. Everybody's putting it in the oven, but nobody's turning on the oven. <laughs> the oven, the spark is curiosity. So once you turn on the spark, you get your cake. And that's what uh, leaders need to realize, in, that curiosity is what makes us innovative. Uh, if, if we're not curious, we're not going to create the next big thing. We're not going to be engaged. We're just going to drag our butts to work every day and not really love what we do uh, because we can't explore and, and find our natural passions. And uh, so, you know, there's a great piece by Francesca Gino, who was on my show, who's a Harvard professor, who is also in Thinkers 50. Uh, she did some research on the case, making a case for curiosity in HBR. So, you know, Harvard Business Review has great articles, as we all know. And uh, I recommend reading that one because she talks about, you know, how important it is for um, all, all different aspects and how, you know, leaders, she and I talked about how leaders think that they encourage this level of curiosity in their people. But if you uh, survey their followers, they don't see it the same way. So the perception is different, which is kind of why I wrote about perception later. But it, it's fascinating to see um, how much we need to emulate what we want to see. And a lot of leaders don't do that, unfortunately. Well, look, I'm not the smartest guy. I, I, I realize this. I realize this. But I, I got to push back a little bit. See, this is you utilizing your analogy. Um, if no one turned the oven on, I mean, couldn't we just keep dipping our finger in the cake batter and eating it? I mean, we can consider. <laughs> you could, you could, but which would you think you'd sell more cake batter or do you think you'd sell more cake? <laughs> Point well, oh, we're, you're good. You're good. You're yeah. Good. <laughs> Never had anybody say that, but hey, that's my answer to that. <laughs> well, but here, here's the problem we run into, though, is that. Is that we, we we say and you say right? You say curiosity is important, and again, I'm with you. I'm, I'm here with you. At the <laughs> same time, you know the listeners listening to this right now and watching this right now, they want to move up in the leadership ranks. They want to become executives or senior executives. But we also know that we'll, we we feel at least. That if we're if we're too curious, that means we're asking questions. We're asking questions. That means we don't know something. If we don't know something, we can't be smart. We can't be ready for the next level. How do you square those two? Asking questions while also not looking incompetent. And the reality is, is every scary movie has told us that curiosity kills the cat. I'm not. If I hear something in the woods. I'm not walking out there. It's just me. That's such a good point. Uh, and this, you know, hopefully your work environment isn't a scary movie where they're going to uh, you know, jump out and kill you. But um, you know, it's a very important point. And that's what I researched. And I, what I wanted to find out is what stops us and what stops us, if in case you're curious, are four things, which you touched on uh, a couple of them there. Uh, and the four things are fear, uh, assumptions, which is the voice in your head, uh, 
and a technology over and under utilization of it and environment, which is basically everybody we've ever known or anybody we've ever been around. And so what you're talking about is fear of uh, looking like we're asking too many questions that we aren't gonna look good. That leads to the voice in our head, the assumptions. Uh, so FATE, F-A-T-E was the acronym to remember fear, assumptions, technology and environment. Yeah. So we do that, right? We we tell ourselves, I'm not gonna ask this question. I am gonna look like an idiot. So I'm gonna lean over to Alex over here and bump him and say, hey, Alex, why don't you ask this? You know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> make yeah, him yeah. look stupid, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's but happened. The, it's you know it's true that we we do hold ourselves back, and so you know you got to have leaders buy in from the top that curiosity is important. If you don't have a leader who who's already seeing this as important yet, if you're at a lower level, you can always say, "Hey, I'm trying to develop my curiosity. I don't want you to take my questions that I as something I, I don't know something or that I'm challenging you." And if you you know buffer it like that, it gives them an idea that oh, you're not telling me. I'm stupid or you're not stupid or whatever, you know what I mean? And that's really important. As leaders, we have to emulate what we want to see in people. We have to say, I know this is what I used to think was a stupid question, but there are no stupid questions. And so I'm going to ask it to show you. I want to tell you that there's nothing, nothing that you shouldn't be asking. And I think if we learn to preface what we're saying with, this is to help me build my curiosity, or this is to help you build your curiosity, Sometimes that helps get the ball rolling at the beginning when people aren't used to doing this. Once you get used to doing it, you don't want to say it every single time because then you're going to annoy people. But it, it tells you that, you know, this is our culture. I mean, I've interviewed people like Xander Lurie from SurveyMonkey who trades in, you know, curiosity. Basically, they changed their address to one curiosity way for SurveyMonkey because they carry they care so much. Wow. Right. So they, you know, they know that when they're there or Novartis where they get rewarded for a hundred hours of curiosity kind of things and learning education based things that leadership wants you to be curious. So if you're in an organization and you're at the top, you, you want to, you know, emulate that and have these programs. I, I went back to New York one time a year or two, a few years ago before um, COVID um, and did some videos for Verizon. Uh, that they made little snippets of me talking about curiosity. And then they took people from their uh, organization who were curious and had been successful because of it and did little vignettes about, you know, here, this is why I got to be successful because of curiosity. And they took these videos of me and them together and they made onboarding videos to show this is our culture. We want this. That's so cool. Yeah. It plays in all their stores. It plays in everywhere. That, so people know that it's good to ask questions. We want this. I love that that example. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it was cool. It, they're great videos too. They did a wonderful job. Well, of course. I mean, if you're in the video, it's going to be a great video. We, we all know this. <laughs> yeah, <of course. laughs> Wait, you, you make me think like, I, I love the, I always call them excuses. Like I love excuses. I have a love hate relationship with excuses. Um, <laughs> when it comes to getting work done, like I've never been excused. That. It's like, yeah. I'm going to figure out how to get it done. It will get done. We may right. tinker around the edges, but it's going to get done. Um, but in regards to like learning and development, I love excuses because mm -hmm. as you know, like if you provide people with a reason, they're more, more likely to comply. And so if I can give someone an excuse, like, Hey, you know what? I just read this book by by Dr. Hamilton that says I need to be really leaning into this curiosity. I'm going to start asking some more questions more like you know, more often. Do you mind mm -hmm. just kind of you know allowing me that space? Like they'll be, oh yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, like, I, I, yeah. Do you have any other recommendations for you know how do you provide that space for people who want to be more curious? Um, and and maybe they don't feel safe per se asking questions. You know, the great culture, but they need to be more curious. I think anytime you have a one-on-one -on -one with your leader and say, I'm looking for developmental opportunities for me, I thought, you know, I kind of did a personal SWOT analysis or whatever you want to, however you want to bring it up, you know, things I could improve. And I think if I develop my curiosity, I think I could be more innovative for the company. And I think that would lead to better um, outcomes for everybody. So I hope you don't mind if you see, I, know I start to ask more questions. And it's not that I don't know anything or it's just, I want to develop myself. And, and I think it's really important important for, um, you know, we've, we've, we know that Gallup has shown that uh, companies are losing 500 plus billion a year in the U.S. on engagement. So I think if, you know, if you 
if I can explore different areas, if you would uh, allow me maybe to float around in this part of the company or that part of the company, see things, I could find things that I'm really good at that I don't even know I'm good at. Uh, and things like that, people do all the time. I interviewed a guy, Olin Odekoven, he, Dr. Odekoven's uh, got his own um, education-based company, a big one here, um, uh, where he was talking about um, how he hires people without even knowing exactly what job he has in mind for him yet. He sees something in them and he goes, oh, this person would be great at Peregrine, in his company. And um, he lets them float around for a while, do different things and try different things. And then he creates the job description based around what they're good at. Now, a lot of companies can't afford that. They don't have that uh, opportunity to do that. But it's a really cool thing if you can do that to allow people to be really good and do certain things. Of course, not, you know, everybody gets to do everything they only love. Somebody's got to scrub toilet somewhere. Somebody's got to do some things, you know, but <laughs> we have to, uh, you know, hey, maybe this one thing is my great thing and nobody's ever given me that opportunity to try it. And so I think a lot of that would be great. I mean, I, I remember as a pharmaceutical rep for AstraZeneca, I've worked for them for so many years and 20 years in that company. And I, I, I used to get so excited to do my paperwork. <laughs> Everybody thought I was such a nerd, right? Nerd alert. Everybody else hated paperwork. I mean, they hated it. They, were, they, were, they couldn't wait to be in the field. I couldn't wait for my expense report, right? So everybody's got their niche of what they like. And when I left that, I went into being a loan officer because I thought, what's the most paperwork thing I could do, right? <laughs> so yeah, sometimes yeah. you have to discover the things that you love uh, and uh, you don't know that until they give you the opportunity. And so asking for that opportunity, if, if it's available, why not? You, you know, what's funny is you know, how life works. Um, my wife and I were talking about her, uh, her, how she grew up. And so she's from Southeast Asia and uh, she grew up in, in Myanmar. And um, she was saying how I'm like, hey, my hun, like, what did you want to be when you grew up? And she's like, well, actually, um, I wanted to be a, a flight attendant. Uh, and then I wanted to be an ambassador because of one of my friends. His dad was an ambassador and they just did some really cool stuff. And then I actually wanted to be a travel agent. And then I wanted to, and she started listing all these things out. And I was like, huh, like, you know what's really cool about this? Cause, and then, oh, sorry. And then she says, she says, yeah, you know, everything I, um, everything I thought I wanted to do was you know, because like, you know, I saw people doing it and I was like, how cool is that? Like the reality is, is that it, putting your, yourself in spaces where you can be around different ideas, different people, different cultures. It, it, if you have a mind that is curious, curiosity focus, right? You're going to kind of this tingle, dingle around, I guess, and see what you like about each one. And then you can put something together and create something completely new. Um, and it can, I mean, if you think about this from a leadership st standpoint, you're creating your own unique brand of leadership by being curious and learning something about all these different topics. Does that sound crazy? No, I think you should get up on stage with me and share that. <laughs> because I think it's important. I agree with that. Everything you said, Alex, you know, because I think that the more we get exposed to different aspects of what's available to us, the more we can find out where we can excel. If people try to put us into these little boxes, these cubicles, these silos, whatever it is, you know, some of the best lessons learned uh, are from, sorry about that sound, um, are about um, just getting outside and looking at different industries for ideas. I mean, I, I in my book, I wrote about a company, I was actually a hospital in London who was having problems with their people were actually dying more often from going at, from their surgery into recovery than they'd yeah. like, right? We wanted to improve that. And they went through the whole checklist of the things we've always done, go through and make sure we're doing everything. And they couldn't make anything better. And so they, uh, they thought about it. And one night, a couple of executives were watching a formula one race car event. And they watched the Ferrari team take apart the car and put it back together in seven seconds. So this really cool thing. And they're like, look at them, they could do that without any hitches. And why can't we do this? So they actually brought the Ferrari team into the hospital and had them watch them That's and so give cool. them suggestions and made a huge difference, right? So they, they save lives. 
because they aren't just in their cubicle, they aren't just in their silo, in their industry, they're, they're looking outside and they're going, yes, let me explore, let me uh, get some great ideas from different industries. And the more we can get people to do that, the more you can you can learn. Another example was um, a hybrid bike company uh, was having problems sent, sending their bicycles through the mail and they kept breaking. And they were like, okay, so we'll try it. Maybe we'll look at the box, see if there's a problem with the box, you know, but we don't want to spend, you know, all this money to double the size of our box and do all this stuff. So they couldn't figure out any way to do it. It wouldn't cost a lot of money. And they thought about, well, what else ships in this same big flat box? Like we ship our bikes. And they looked and they found that flat screen TVs ship in a very similar box. <laughs> and they got, uh huh. And they weren't breaking nearly as much as their bikes. And they thought, well, how is that possible? And then they realized there was only really one big difference between the two boxes. And that was the flat screen had a picture of a flat screen on the box. And they thought, <laughs> what if we take a few pennies of ink and put a flat screen? TV on our box. What do you think happened? <laughs> a lot less breaking. Stop right? breaking. <laughs> right, right. So it could be from another industry, another weirdo situation that you wouldn't have thought of. Yeah. And I love that they looked at these these other aspects because sometimes we just get too, you know, micro, mm -hmm. and we have to look outside ourselves. Well. You, you, you know, you've been, again, talking about how important it is to, to be curious. Now you transitioned that, that conversation to the importance of being curious and moving outside of your own buckets, your own organizations, your own groups and industries, which is, again, 100% makes sense. I'm, I'm with you. I'm here. I'm, I'm loving it. Um, my, my question is, you know, yes, there are leaders who who will say, you know what, stop wasting your time, get back to work, you're out there lollygadding, you're networking for your next job. You know, if they may believe that any time thing you're doing outside the organization is not negative. Let's put those people aside. Okay. There are a lot of people who, who simply just believe that, that doing what you're talking about is, is extracurricular versus being essential to their job and their leadership. And, and what would you say to those people then? How would we change their mind on this? Well, I think, you know, those people have had maybe leaders who've said the same thing to them. You know what I mean? Some of it goes around and around and around in the industry. And I think it's looking at what, what are you trying to fix? Is your, what's your problem? Is your problem engagement? Okay, we know you're losing 550 billion a year in the US is like whatever the number is lately from Gallup. And we know that engaged people are not productive. I mean, not uh, disengaged people, people who are unengaged, I should say, uh, are just not super uh, productive. If you're trying to be productive, you need to work on that within the company. It's not an extracurricular thing, right? It's mm -hmm. right now, oh, wow. right here. So some of the things you can do to improve engagement are curiosity based, really, because uh, engagement is about, you know, you're more engaged if you can explore and if you have friends in the company that you have interactions with, think of all the things that, that Gallup shares. But part of this uh, developing all of that is developing empathy. If you have, a, we know emotional intelligence is critical, right? We don't develop our emotional intelligence in a vacuum. It's not something you just work on at home. You work on it everywhere. And a big part of emotional intelligence is empathy. And if you, to have empathy, how do you do that? Well, a lot of it's asking questions. It's a curiosity for me to know what's important to Alex. I have to ask, ask you, you know, yeah, Alex, yeah. You know, well, would you like this? Is this something that interests you? Those curiosity skills are something that you do need to develop at work. Uh, otherwise you get all the interpersonal communication issues and conflict, which we know is super expensive. <laughs> well, but, but it's, but it's so much more fun though. I mean, imagine a place without conflict, <laughs> It'd be so boring. Yeah, is, it's kind of like having your own soap opera. But, it, you know, it's, it's it's really, it's interesting because as you're talking about this, it ties into some of the work that Dr. Maya Zelhich and I did in our book on perception. Because after I wrote about curiosity, I was very interested in how 
emotional intelligence and curiosity tie into perception of what we think is important and how we look at things. And do we need to do it at work? Do we need to do it elsewhere? Whatever. All those things are perception based. And perception is a, a combination of like IQ, EQ for emotional quotient, CQ for curiosity quotient, and CQ for cultural quotient. And all these things, you know, interact. And if you leave out the curiosity component, it's a real problem because you lose the empathy. You lose a lot of those things that the cake, you end up with putting your finger in the goo at the end. And that's not good enough. I mean, for me, I want cake. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's something that uh, I think a lot of leaders are starting to see more of uh, the importance It'd be just especially COVID kind of opened up the door to oh my goodness we didn't have this plan we didn't have think about these things we didn't think about yeah. that and you know as a leader some of the most successful leaders work super curious at work I've interviewed Doug Khan a couple times who turned around Campbell Soup and his case studies are in a lot of the courses I teach and he, part of the reason that he was able to improve engagement there and save so much money for Campbell's was he got interested in what people were about. And he wrote more than 30,000 handwritten notes in his time there wow. about like, thank you for doing that or yeah. whatever. He found out what they were doing. He found out what they were interested in enough to write a note that was meaningful. And if you're saying curiosity is something you got to do at home, well, you're missing the whole point of how it lights that spark to, you know what I mean? And I think the problem is some people say, well, my leader just doesn't get it. And, you know, sometimes you, you know, yeah. you're working in the wrong company. Maybe your, your leader at the top is either going to be gone mm -hmm. eventually if he doesn't or she doesn't um, get it. And or uh, you will be gone eventually because you won't be able to take it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's what happens. Preach, preacher. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, you knew this was going to happen. Like you knew, like. I'm 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 serious most of the time, but you know, no, no, I'm not. I mean, I, I'm actually, I'm, it's the opposite. I'm, I'm never. Sorry. So I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's more fun. Yes, it's so much more fun. Yes. Uh, so you know, so uh, my wife and I, uh, we do a lot of donating to uh, the homeless. Like that, that's come, something we we kind of focus in on homeless mm -hmm. and youth. Mm -hmm. Um. And the other day, so we actually keep care packages in the car. So sometimes when we're driving around, we see someone, we can then give it to them if, if, uh -huh. if they want it, right? Uh -huh. And so we saw this guy, his name is Richard, and we pulled up next to him and my wife's got out to give him, say, hey, you know, is there something you like? Um, we have this. And he was like, well, actually, um, I can't eat most of this stuff that you're giving me. Um, I have diabetes. And um, he's like, but actually, like, thank you for asking he said, most people just, you know, he's sitting next to a Wendy's. Most people just buy Wendy's and give me the food. I, I can't eat it. Um, so I don't want to waste food. So I have to find someone else to give it to. He's like, I just, I just want some broccoli. I can, I can steam it myself, just some broccoli. And it, it, it underscored the point you made now multiple times in our conversation. Um, if you want to provide value, you have to be curious. You have to ask. If you just, even in, even in those situations where you're trying to help someone, if you don't ask them what they want, what they need, you may be giving something that maybe you want, or but it may not right. have and much that value to them. A lot. It really does. And it's wonderful that you guys do that. I, I, I admire that so much. And it reminds me of um, when I left in pharmaceuticals and went into lending, I, I worked for a, 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 as an account executive. And basically it was a dialing for dollars. You know, they throw you the phone book here, go call these numbers. <laughs> and um, they did this contest and I'm super competitive. So it wouldn't have mattered what the prize was, but the prize for being on the phone for the longest in, during the day was given every week. Um, you, they tr wanted you to make for like four hours on, of phone calls. Uh, the rest of the time you had, you couldn't be on all the time. It's not like you could rig the system because you had to do your paperwork. You had to do all these other things, right? But um, every week I would get well over four hours and nobody could get close to me with the two hours or whatever they got. And so I won every week just because it was super competitive and efficient, not that the prize was any good. The mm -hmm. prize was something I already had. It was Suns tickets and I already had Suns tickets. <laughs> and so I didn't even need them or want them and I'd give them away at, at the, after I'd win them. But they they should have asked. What if I didn't like basketball, or what if I didn't want to go to some game? Or, you know, a lot of times they give me presents or prizes and stuff 
that are night stuff. And I want to go to bed. I don't want to go out at night. I mean, <laughs> I, you know, you don't know what people want, Yeah, yeah. you know, until you ask. So that's a really important thing. Now in sales, if you're super competitive, sometimes it doesn't even matter what the prize is, but for some people, you know, it's going to matter. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, you, you, you... One thing. So look, everyone who's listening, everyone who's watching, if you haven't done it already, you need to go to LinkedIn and you need to look her up because you, you're, you're awesome. You produce wonderful content. Let's everyone listen to her podcast. Awesome. You have got in the room. You've been in the room with very, very successful people. Some of those, just a fraction of those people you've mentioned today in conversation. Um, you, You've done this. And my question is, is in order to do this, I feel like you need to have some sort of, you need to carry yourself a certain type of way, I guess, or be in certain circles. You know, if someone is looking to advance into, again, those senior level executive positions, you know, how do you think as a leader, they should be carrying themselves in order to be seen where they can be getting into these conversations and, and exposing themselves to those new those new ideas and strategies and whatnot. You know, experience counts for a lot. And to get that experience, you have to surround yourself with people who are smarter than you are. You have to look for mentorship around you from people who you admire and who you want to emulate to some extent. You you just, a lot of people make the mistake of just trying to figure it out on their own and reinventing the wheel. And that's a problem to become more sophisticated requires confidence and confidence takes some time of doing things. Um, I mean, just doing my radio show when I first was given this show uh, or, you know, the opportunity to do the show, I'd never done a radio show. I'd never done anything like that. This was what more than five years ago uh, that it started. And I've interviewed, I don't know, 1500 people since then. So, so I, um, you know, I, I, I had the sense of confidence from being in sales and I, I'm I'm fortunate and and anybody who ever has a chance to go into sales, that'll give you the confidence of having 80 people a day hang up on you when you're dialing for dollars right there. You have to learn to be a little bit tougher. Yeah. But for those who haven't been in sales, sometimes you just have to just say, like you said before, I'm going to do it. I don't know. Maybe I don't know how to do it, but I'm going to figure it out. And a lot of people, when I tell them how I did it, they go, I can't believe you would do that. I'm like, well, yeah. well, well, you just figure it out. You just do it. And I had never done a radio show. I, the only person I'd interviewed was billionaire uh, Ken Fisher. I had asked him uh, to talk before one of his talks he gave at, For- at our Forbes School of Business when I was the um, MBA program chair there. And uh, my very first interview is taking on the hardest billionaire who's the smartest guy in the room, right? <laughs> but because I'm like, what's he going to do? You know, and it's, it's funny if you watch it, it's on YouTube. And um, I've seen on it. Because <laughs> yeah. I, I, the very first time I'm talking to him, uh, I said, you know, I've watched your interviews. He goes, I'm nicer than that. And I go, <laughs> I go, yeah, you are. You're doing pretty well. And he goes, yeah, I haven't even started the profanity yet or something like that is the very first (laughs) part of my very first interview. And I immediately thought he was funny. But, you know, I could have been intimidated if you, you know, a lot of people probably would find that intimidating or not know what to say. You just got to have a sense of humor and just go, okay, yeah, that's funny. And because he saw he couldn't intimidate me and he saw I was having fun with him, he he and I became friendly and I like him. He's a great guy. Um, But, you know, I had had that under my belt, but that's the only interview really I'd ever done. And I just had somebody else that interviewed me on their show. And, and because I liked doing that interview with him, I, I said, uh, how'd you get this job? Because it was a nationally syndicated job. And he goes, I could get you a spot if you want to do it. And I go, sure. So I called the guy and he goes, yeah, you got to start in two weeks and you got to have two weeks full of shows and, and you know, figure it out. And you got to do all your editing, all your everything by yourself. All right. So I, I did it. So I had to go to like Guitar City to buy these equipment things that I didn't even know, you know what I mean? That would attach your phone. The hardest thing is attaching your phone to the, the Mac. I had to get a Mac. I had to get all this stuff. And, you know, I did it. And, and I was fortunate that I knew people who had like Forbes 30 under 30s who were successful um, that uh, who had really made it of sort of, you know, on their own. And they knew me sort of from coming in and speaking. But to come up with that in two weeks and figure it all out was, you know, a lot of people wouldn't do that. 
but you, because they would talk them, they were back to assumptions in fear. You'd go, oh, I can yeah. never do that. I would be, no, I don't have enough time or I never, you know, I wouldn't be any good or the sound quality won't be perfect or, you know, done is better than perfect. Mm -hmm. Get out there and just do it because you'll learn from it. <sighs> you're so right. <laughs> I mean, you're, can you're, I use that as my sound bite? Every time you call me, I'll just have it. <laughs> <sighs> you're so oh, right. You're so right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, so, you know, um, we, so you, you mentioned something that I, 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 I want to ask you a question about. So you said you, you never want to be the smartest person in your, in, in your group, right? You want to be around great, wonderful, awesome, super smart people so they can help grow and teach you and inspire you to move forward. Absolutely. Um, I ran into a, 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 a an individual, a leader a year ago or so, man, with COVID, I, time just goes. Um, yeah. And he he shared that I was like, hey, you know, you never want to be the smartest person. He's like, Alex, uh, I am actually like, I'm literally the least successful person in my group. Now he's done well. He's done very well. <laughs> Yeah. But he's like, I am literally the least successful person in my group. Right, right. And I'm not sure how I feel about that. Like he he felt <laughs> he felt a little bit like, oh my God, am I doing enough? Like is there the other side of being the you know, the if you're actually the <laughs> like the, the least smartest, the least successful person in your group, how do you get over those feelings? Um, you know, I guarantee you somebody else in the group's thinking the same thing. Uh, that he's thinking, <laughs> you know what I mean? You always think that. I, I, I mean, I walked around Thinkers 50 in London, you know, every single professor from Harvard, every single, you know, will, you know, you're impressed by everybody. I mean, Marshall Goldsmith and everybody who's in the room has had experiences that maybe I haven't had, but the, the guy who thinks that they're the least successful has had experiences that the other person hasn't had. I guarantee you I've had an experience that Marshall Goldsmith or somebody else in that room hasn't had. That doesn't make me any dumber or smarter than them. It's just different. And if you constantly compare yourselves to others, you know, that's going to be a big problem. You have to keep comparing yourself to yourself. Are you, am I getting better? Am I growing? Am, you know, it doesn't matter if you're the smartest person. I remember going to the Genius Network and watching, uh, Randy Zuckerberg uh, Berg on stage and all these really famous people were there. You know, Naveen Jain has been on my show. He's a billionaire and done biome and all these big companies. And, you know, all these people were walking around, Vern Harnish, you name it. They were all there. And you just, and Tony Robbins, you know, you, you're walking around and you're like, okay, that's Tony Robbins right next to me, you know? And it, it's, you, you forget, you know, they're just people just like you are just, they've just had different experiences. I, I just shared the stage with Dan Pink. You know, I've always loved Dan Pink's work. I've there, it doesn't matter. Once you get behind the scenes sometimes and what you and I do, and you get to talk to people, you go, Oh, okay. They're just normal people. Just, you know, I, I mean, I yeah. have a picture of me with my arms around Wozniak on a stage, you know, I have, <laughs> <laughs> it was funny. It was, you know, they're just, people just like you are, and you can learn from them. It's just age and experience is only difference really in most cases that they've done things you haven't done and you've done things and everybody can learn from everybody else. <sighs> You're so right. <laughs> that's, that's our tagline now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so I look, I, I know that you're, you're, you have to jump off at a moment. I think you have to, you know, a private jet to, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> where, where was it? You're, you're going to yeah, Dubai, was it? Uh, somewhere. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a, a queen of a country somewhere. Yeah, I, I know you have things to do. So I, I want to really quickly just open the, the floor back up to you. Say, is there anything? you would like to share with our audience as we begin to wrap up, which is, you know, anything you're working on, anything you like them to consider, look at, or just final thoughts. You know, I've been doing a new uh, podcast called for the Global Mentor Network. I uh, work with them on their board and it's kind of fun because I'm interviewing CHROs and heavy duty people in the HR space. And I co-author, I mean, co-host that with uh, tu uh, Tui Vu. And uh, she's the CEO of Global Mentor N Network, which was co-created by her and Keith Kroc, the former uh, 
CEO and chair, you know, of uh, DocuSign and billionaire genius of the world who I love. Um, he uh, created this company with her. And so it's fun to do that. So in my show and that show are still going, but my, you know, all my stuff, you could find me at, at Dr. Diane Hamilton, just the DR for doctor uh, on all the social media sites. If you hear me here, please let me know. That's where you heard me, my information, but uh, my website's just drdianehamilton.com and everything's there. You could take the curiosity code index or the perception power index or any of my um, information. It's all there. Okay. I want to do that one again, but um, thank you. So I was going to do that. Um, thank you so much. This is why people should listen and watch this podcast. We have so much fun. Um, we do. <laughs> um, look, thank you everyone so much for listening today. And thank you, uh, Diane, for, for just being here and sharing so much of the phenomenal advice and wisdom that you have, um, you've collected and created over the years. Um, everyone knows what I'm about to say now, right? Don't just look back, reach back. If you found anything of value in today's talk, don't keep it to yourself. Don't say that person over there should have been here. Don't do that. Don't, don't, don't be that guy or gal. Bring this content to them and say, look, you need to sit down or stand up and watch this or even lay down, really. Just lay down, sit down, stand up and listen to this, watch this. As always, I want to say everyone, stay strong, stay positive, and definitely stay moving. See ya. Thanks for listening to The Executive Appeal with Alex Trumbull. I invite you to follow The Executive Appeal wherever you listen to podcasts. Follow me, your host, Alex Trumbull, across all socials or via email for exclusive webinars, courses, and his speaking engagements on continued topics of executive leadership. So until next time, stay strong, stay positive, and definitely stay moving.